Welcome. Yeah, thank you for joining us on, on fairly uh, uh, short notice. Um, uh, I'm Tim Brigland, the chair of the House Energy and Technology Committee. Right. And um, Jared, I've been reading some of the information that the Department of Health had been putting out on climate change. Yes. Um, we didn't uh, invite you in here to specifically talk about a, um, a particular <coughs> bill okay. um, as an aside. Uh, we have a bill just before our committee right now that deals with um, uh, climate change in a, in a big way okay. and how our state government would be involved in um, uh, mitigating both greenhouse gas emissions and also addressing kind of adaption and resilience issues. Um, okay. And some of those uh, would certainly be related to how climate change um, affects people's health. Okay. And uh, I know the Department of Health has, uh, in recent years, done a fair amount of work uh, on that. Um, and I uh, appreciate you uh, sharing some of that work with us today. So, sure. again, welcome. Thank you. Happy yeah. to be here. Um, good morning. Yeah, and we're, we're taping this for the record. OK, great. So, you know, so if you could introduce yourself, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, good morning. I'm Jared Ulmer, uh, Climate and Health Program Manager at the Department of Health. Um, and. I wasn't sure exactly how you wanted to proceed. I have about 15 minutes worth of slides that I can walk through that kind of give an overview of some of the material you were asking about. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to do something more just conversational, that's fine too. Just yeah, well, how we, would you like we, to? we try not to be rude, but we often interrupt. Uh, oh, and we'll, try, we'll yeah. try and keep that. It's, it's to help set up the conversation. Okay. So yeah, it's set up for interruption. That's great. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of documents that you mm -hmm. have uh, that are listed um, on our committee's website. Okay. And uh, so this one is just so I've got the right one up. Um, this is the presentation that I could run through. Okay. Uh, you should also have um, there's our climate change and health in Vermont report um, okay. from 2017, which is kind of it's it's like a 20 page um, summary of all of the work that we had done to date on exploring climate impacts on health in Vermont. Okay. Um, so it's kind of the Extended summary of a 150-page report that we produced okay. earlier. Yeah. Okay. So those are the two main things. I think the other thing was just a link to our climate and health website. Yep. Okay. Um, well, I I can just start walking through this presentation, but um, feel free to interrupt and and uh, we can chat in more detail about any of these. I just want to kind of give you an overview of some of the different. Um, things that we work on through the Climate and Health Program and just as a way of introduction. Um, we uh, were established in 2012 uh, through a grant from the Centers for Disease Control. Um, there's 18 cities and states on the map uh, behind me that show the, the different um, places that have received our similar grant and are continuing to be funded. Um, so we have this kind of network of collaborators um, across the country. and a really nice cluster of them in the Northeast that are working on similar issues to us that you know gives us folks that we can compare notes um, with and, and work together on some of our um, similar initiatives like in the Northeast, um, tick-borne diseases and, and cyanobacteria blooms, for example. Um, I'm going to go on to the next slide, which is just we always start acknowledging that climate change is happening. Um, this frames all of the work that we do, that Vermont's getting warmer. Our warm season is um, lengthening, our cold season shrinking, um, and we've also been getting wetter over time, um, particularly with heavy rain events, um, though we do acknowledge that there have been drought events sprinkled in. Um, these kind of weather extremes are something that we're coming to um, expect more and more of having extended wet periods and extended dry periods, but overall expecting it to, to get wetter here over time. Um, I'm going to go ahead to the next slide to jump into the health effects. Um, so the seven health effects that I have on the screen behind me are the ones that we identified through some of our early analysis as being the seven that are probably most relevant for Vermont that we try to raise awareness about and um, work on various strategies to address. Um, and I'm going to step through uh, those in the subsequent, subsequent slides. Um, All seven. Uh, <laughs> Yes, one slide each, so it'll be pretty pretty quick. I'm sorry, can you go back? Oh yes, the, sure. Just one uh, back, one more. Oh yes. The, the seven inch increase in precipitation. Right. Roughly, what's Vermont's annual precipitation? How much of an increase is that? I think it's about forty. To, I'm, I'm 
if we're getting right now, 42 inches is where we're at or where we started, but okay. around the 40 to 50 inch zone. So 15% or thereabout increase. Sounds about right, yep. Um, so I always um, start talking about heat illnesses. This is one of the areas that we focus the most on because there wasn't much attention on hot weather and health impacts um, prior to this program starting. Um, we, in some of our early analysis, um, explored some Vermont-specific data that um, made it clear to us that Vermonters are experiencing health effects from hot weather at temperatures that we don't maybe don't think of as being that hot, like mid to upper 80s we start to see emergency room visits increase, um, and even for older, ad older adults, um, more deaths on days that, that start to reach the upper 80s um, and warmer. Um, so we've looked at how we expect temperatures to change over time. In the recent past, we only have about six days a year that reach 87 or warmer, and some of our climate projections that um, we've received from working with folks at the University of Vermont um, show that we, we can expect the, the number of days reaching the mid-80s or warmer to um, double or even triple um, by mid-century, um, and we may have as many as um, three to five weeks of days reaching 87 or warmer by the end of the century. And just for perspective, 2018, which was a really abnormally hot summer for us, we had about 18 or 19 days that would have met this threshold. So our 2018 was, um, we kind of like to think of as a a preview of what will become a normal summer for Vermont in probably 30 years. So, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, I know you have this with lower emissions and higher emissions. So, what is the time frame? I'm sorry. Oh, no, I see it. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I across it. the bottom, it's yeah. progressing it further into the future. Got it. Right. So, depending, you know, lots of factors depending on how quickly we warm. Those are sort of our high and low end estimates for those different time periods. And, okay, just wondering about the deviation from normal also. Sorry, can you so, elaborate on so that? So what, um, no, that's good. Okay. Um, happy to circle back to that. Um, and I, I, um, I actually have two slides on heat um, because I wanted to talk about our projections and some of what we experienced in 2018 during the six-day heat wave that we had from June 30th to July 5th. Um, we were at 93 degrees or warmer for six consecutive days, which was one of the, the hottest um, and longest heat waves we've had on record in Vermont. Um, three of the days, the heat index, which also accounts for humidity. Um, we had three days that it felt like it was um, above 100 degrees. Um, and one of the things that doesn't show up here is we had really high nighttime low temperatures for a couple of days during the heat wave. Um, Burlington Airport recorded the all-time highest low temperature of 80 degrees, which is kind of an odd thing to say, but the temperature never dropped below 80 degrees. Um, I think it was the morning of July 2nd, night of July 1st. Um, and what we observed during that time was that um, our blue bars here are showing people calling 911 for some kind of a heat-related complaint. Um, the purples are people going to the emergency department for a heat-related complaint, and the small green bars are unfortunately for heat-related deaths um, that were recorded during or immediately after that, that heat wave. Um, and these were really kind of unprecedented numbers for, for us. Um, on a typical early July day, we expect one to two emergency department visits for, for perspective, and we were seeing more like um, you know, 15 to 20 uh, on several of these days. Um, we've also never seen more than two heat-related deaths in a calendar year in um, about the previous 15 years of data that we looked at. Um, so having four in a, a one-week period is pretty alarming. Fortunately, those are the only four of 2018, but still four is um, you know, too many from, from our perspective. Um, and a lot of these, the, the people that were affected are older adults um, that don't have air conditioning and often live alone. Um, so a couple layers of challenges there for um, helping keep you know, people in that situation uh, safe and healthy. Is there a particular geography here, or is this the state of Vermont? It's the state of Vermont, okay. yeah. And we have tried to break it down in smaller geographies, and the data get really noisy yeah. um, once we do so. So these are average temperatures for the state, then? Or, or these are? Uh, these were at the Burlington, Burlington Airport. Burlington Airport. Yeah. Right, yes. All right. 
Um, so shifting to tick-borne diseases, and <clears throat> we can kind of lump mosquito-borne diseases in with some of these. Um, we, we've all heard and experienced um, the, the impacts of increasing Lyme disease, and my bar at the bottom of the slide is anaplasmosis, which is a little more severe tick-borne disease that's also um, spread by the, the deer tick, um, the same as that spreads Lyme disease. Um, so we know we've been seeing increases in tick-borne diseases in the state. Um, we, th we think some of that is attributable to climate change, but it's certainly not just a climate change issue. Um, there's a lot of forest fragmentation and, um, and just other habitat issues with uh, the, the deer tick really um, expanding from areas to the south of us, expanding further north over time. Um, as it's kind of repopulated, reforested areas where ticks likely were hundreds of years ago. Um, and then when we deforested everything, they were largely wiped out and a lot of their, their hosts, um, like de uh, deer and mice, were wiped out. Yes? So uh, this past summer, I had mm -hmm. a tick on me mm -hmm. and uh, it was probably there for more than 24 hours. Okay. I had it extracted. I went, <clears throat> took it to the doctor and uh, he gave me some uh, oxycycline. Okay. That's what it's called. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, um, doxycycline, I think is what it's called. Okay. Okay. But I called up the um, Department of Health. Okay. And I, I said, you know, can I send it in for evaluation for whether it had Lyme disease? And they said, we don't do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when we look at um, 2017 to 2018, it goes from 1,093 down to 614. Mm hmm. I'm wondering how you track that. Sure. Who reports that? Did my doctor report it as a, uh, a possible infection or? Okay. You know what? Sure. Um, and I can I can speak a little <clears throat> bit about this. This is a protocol that our infectious disease folks handle, which is um, not something that I'm directly in, involved with. But um, as far as I understand, when a when a doctor diagnoses that you have contracted a tick-borne disease, which um, there are several different ways that they um, might assess that. Uh, they're actually required to report that case to the health department, um, and they, they um, get classified as probable or confirmed depending on the severity of the symptoms and the type, the type of symptoms. So that's what's being shown here are cases that were reported by physicians as being probable or, or confirmed cases to the so health department. So it's not tick bites. It's that's the actual cases of diagnosed that's disease. correct, right? Um, which we, the health department does track tick bites as well. Um, if you just went to see a, a doctor because of a tick bite, um, we track those, but those don't necessarily link to um, tick-borne diseases, for example. Right. Are they required to report any tick bites? They are not. That's just something that we can pull out of um, what's called syndromic surveillance data um, that gives us kind of almost real-time information about um, why people are going to the hospital. Um, it's kind of used to detect, um, give early detection of infectious diseases or if there was bioterrorism or something like that. But we can use it for a lot of other things like um, tracking tick bites. So I would postulate that uh, the number of actual Incidence of tick bites is much higher than 614. Oh, absolutely. Yes. No, you're you're absolutely right about that. These are just the subset of people that were symptomatic enough to go to the doctor and have it diagnosed. And even these, we think this is underreporting actual cases of Lyme disease, since some people end up being asymptomatic or just their symptoms aren't bad enough to to seek treatment. Um, so I think these are still underreporting. Um, and you pointed out the drop to 614 in 2018, which uh, it is interesting. And we think this is climate related in the sense that 2018 was very hot and, and dry, um, which is not good, uh, a n not a good environment for a tick to be in. Um, ticks like warm and moist, which is part of why we have the climate concern. The more, the warmer and moister we are, that's better tick habitat for survival and reproduction and survival of the hosts that they depend on. Um, but you, you cross this threshold of, you know, t you can get too warm for a tick, um, and you can definitely get too, too dry for a tick. And 2018 was a very dry and very hot year, so uh, that's part of why we would attribute that, that drop in 2018. 
That's good for that. Do you have any any notion of data from 2019 yet? Or I don't. You don't. Sorry. Because um, my my just uh, uh, anecdotal experience around my house was that uh, 2019 I saw a lot fewer ticks, and I think it was also quite dry. And okay. So yeah, maybe that maybe that's the reason why. It, yeah. Right. No, that yeah. that could be. So I'm talking to that there were two um, two big reasons. One is the climate change. But another is also when we are restoring habitats. Yeah, there's been sort of this natural, you know, repopulation of um, the whole Northeast after, you know, we, we cleared all the forests, forests have started to come back and, um, you know, so have the deer and lots of other critters. Um, so the, the tick population was really kind of concentrated in southern New England when our forest cover was at its poorest. Um, uh, hundred years ago, just <laughs> kind of guessing, but um, but ever since then, the the habitat has been much more conducive for ticks. So there's been sort of this natural expansion from southern New England. Um, that climate change helps speed to some extent by by making places further and further north um, suitable for for ticks. Um, but I guess, I guess my point was some of that repopulation would have happened without climate change. It's probably <laughs> happening faster um, and to just a, a greater you know, population extent because of climate change. And I, my uh, other question is, I, you know, I've had hunters okay. reach out to me around uh, ticks mm -hmm. and moose. Okay. And seeing you know, some pretty, and I think I reached out to HS, but is that something okay. that is, um, Increasing uh, ticks, impacts on ticks uh, on the, the deer. Um, I believe so, but that's not something that we we directly track. I think um, I think actually ag is is highly focused on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. right. The, there are different types of ticks, and I understand that's right. that the, yeah. the ticks that affect meat, moose herds um, is not the kind that carries Lyme disease, but. Has Other a bad things impact because of the number of bites. Sure, um, right. The, the that, that's my understanding too. <clears throat> um, can, can you speak to the uh, uh, geographic prevalence of ticks in Vermont? My, my sense was that you know even as recent as two, three, four, five years ago. Um, I, I live in kind of central Vermont, okay. and we've had plenty of ticks for years. Okay. Um, but that if, and maybe this is a question for you, Mark, uh, but as you get close to the Canadian border, you don't see them as much. And I don't, I don't know if you track kind of the geographic movement of the prevalence of, you know, some of these infections and where they occur geographically yeah. in the state. And if, if you're seeing more prevalence in the Northeast Kingdom or sure. Orleans, you know, Franklin County relative to, you know, they've probably been in Windsor and Wyndham County for, you know, for years. Right. Um, we have very good data on where people yep. live that have acquired a tick-borne disease and that data shows and you know often that is where they acquired the disease um, that data shows that the southern parts of the state um, Bennington County has sort of been the hot spot for a number of years um, you, you see more of Lyme disease and anaplasmosis and all of these in the southern parts of the state um, but that has been shifting um, northwards and I, I don't know enough about the details for central Vermont but it's certainly there been, there's been lots of tick-borne disease prevalent in central Vermont for years. Um, it's, it's still fairly rare that we see it in the Northeast. Um, mm -hmm. There have been cases of tick-borne diseases in the Northeast. And like I said, we, we can't, um, without a lot of investigation, we can't determine if they actually picked up that tick in the Northeast or maybe they were down in Minnington and then um, went back up. Um, so we, there's some limitations to how we can interpret that data, but we definitely see this gradient of more disease in the south and, and west, and kind of less as you move north and east. Is that still probably from the severity of our winters, the difference? <coughs> I think it's a little bit, these might be related, but a little bit to do with the, um, the, the climate. Um, and winter severity is a little tricky um, because ticks don't really mind being cold. They, kind of go dormant as long as there's, usually as long as there's some snowpack, which is a year that, it'll be interesting to see how things go next year because we don't really have snowpack. Um, they can 
basically go dormant underneath the snowpack, nestle down in some you know mulch litter, and they're fine. Um, we've talked to researchers that collect ticks, put them in a freezer for later uh, you know extraction or whatever they do. Um, take take them out you know months later, put them on the counter, and they start walking around. Huh. Um, so unfortunately, we're, we've learned that cold really doesn't kill ticks. Um, but cold has a big impact on, it has more of an impact probably on the deer, um, the rodents, the other um, animals that ticks depend on. So if deer have a really bad winter, that can affect the ticks. Um, the bad winter won't really affect the ticks directly though. Um, <coughs> but I was also mentioning how the, the tick population is kind of radiated out from southern New England. So I think some of it is just sort of that natural um, expansion from the south is hitting the south part of the state first. How about mosquitoes? Um, mosquitoes uh, have, have not been much of an issue. We haven't seen much mosquito-borne disease. Um, the thing that was interesting this past year is that um, the agency of ag uh, looks for the Asian tiger mosquito, which um, is theoretically a Zika carrier, but it's not the primary mosquito that carries Zika. Um, and can also carry other diseases like um, dengue and chikungunya, more tropical diseases. Um, so they found, for the first time in Vermont, one of these Asian tiger mosquitoes in southern Vermont a couple months ago, um, whether uh, they can actually reproduce and live in Vermont is kind of questionable. It's still a really poor climate for them. It, it could be that it was in um, a, a tire in the back of somebody's truck that drove up from the south and, you know. It's a tourist. Exactly. It could be a tourist. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that it actually is sort of the expectation for the short term is that any mosquitoes that could carry those tropical diseases, um, A, are really, are, in mosquito terms, are really bad at transmitting those diseases, and B, um, are going to be tourists. They're not going to be here for much of the year. Um, so expect the risks from those diseases to still be relatively low. That could change over time. So it's something that you know, we're, all, we're all tracking. Um, from the mosquitoes that are here now, we occasionally see some diseases like um, Eastern Equine Encephalitis uh, or West Nile. Um, but those are still relatively rare and rare enough that I, I couldn't say there's any kind of trend of up or down. The fact that you found one, one tropical mosquito uh, it probably indicate that there's a lot more that you're not detecting because you're not going to find the only one that came to the lot. Right. No, I, su I suspect you're right. And um, you know, from us, it was it, it. It seemed interesting as a as a climate change indicator. We weren't feeling super concerned about the health impacts, at least in the near term. But that's my my expectation too is that there's more out there, and the more climate changes. The longer those tourists are going to hang around, um, so we, we some want, we wanted to move to the right? <laughs> <laughs> it's something. Yeah, we we definitely want to keep tracking. Um, I guess the one other dynamic here that I didn't mention was that with our longer warm seasons and shorter cold seasons, it just gives more days of the year that ticks can be active and that we're likely active outside with them. Um, depending on the research, you'll see that ticks are active above the anywhere from like 30 to 40 degrees. Um, if there isn't snow cover, um, they could be out um, and active. So we do get reported cases of disease in December and January when we get thaws and, and ground clear. Um, so the more you know, the more days that we have that meet those characteristics above 30, no snow cover. There's just more days that we're putting ourselves at risk with um, with ticks. All right, I'm gonna move on to. Um, Extreme weather events, which, um, of course, Tropical Star Storm Irene is the first one that we always end up talking about. But we've seen, even with um, some of the, the less impactful events, that um, declare, FEMA declared disasters and the cost of those disasters has been going up over time. Um, there's certainly lots of great work being done um, to uh, try to make us better prepared for, for those flooding events and other storm events. Um, one of the things that we like to call attention to are some of the lingering impacts from, from those events. Um, and again, most of this was um, very pronounced around Tropical Storm Irene, but there were a lot of impacts to water systems, um, to, food, to food that people grow, to food in people's homes because they lost power. Um, lots of 
at least anecdotes, it's hard to get good data on this, but lots of anecdotes about respiratory impacts um, that people experience during the cleanup of their homes or from going back to their, their flooded homes afterwards um, and from post-traumatic stress disorder um, following that event. Um, so there's lots of sort of ongoing health impacts that um, we, we want to, to keep awareness high about that you know, once the event's gone and that immediate cleanup is gone, there's, there's still these lingering health impacts that we're concerned about. What's going on in that right-hand side picture? Where is that water red? Uh, fuel, um, fuel tank dislodged during the flooding. Mm -hmm. um, related to that, um, we've, we've looked at some data, some um, just drinking water data and recreational water data to see that it, it doesn't take flooding to to experience water quality impacts. The, the bars here, there's a lot of data here, but basically the darker the, the, the bars, those are representing heavier rain events. Um, and on the left, we're, we're, we don't see much impact. This is um, E. coli detection, so an, an indicator of bacteria in drinking water. We don't see many of those in public drinking water, period, but we see more, uh, somewhat more when there's heavier rains. And, pri and private wells, that's somewhat <coughs> common to detect um, E. coli, at least 3% even under dry conditions. Um, and we see those numbers increase more and more um, following heavy rains. Um, and then in recreational waters, um, we also see increases in E. coli at um, places that test the water uh, for, for swimming, uh, some of the beaches on Lake Champlain or state parks, for example. Um, so if the, the heavier rains are wa washing in runoff, um, carrying all kinds of, you know, whatever it may be um, that's, that's leading to this uh, water contamination. So our expectation of having more heavy rain events in the future uh, leads to con concern about more water contamination in the future. Um, so when there are heavy rain events, usually what we hear about are combined septic overflows. Sure. How closely do those correlate to this, or is, the, is it a larger problem of general um, runoff? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, this is just representing general runoff. Um, I would speculate those combined sewer overflow events certainly can contribute, especially with the, the recreational waters, mm -hmm. um, since we do have uh, some, especially the ones um, you know along like Champlain, that there, some, some of the combined sewer overflows do dump out relatively near those. Um, so that's probably a contributing factor here, but this is representing a, a much um, more widespread issue that combined sewer overflows probably aren't the dominant factor here. Um, and related to those, uh, cyanobacteria blooms are um, certainly a, an issue that we've been struggling with for, for years with the, the main climate factor here being the, the lake has gotten a lot warmer. Um, over time. Um, some of the data that we've seen shows that depending on where you take the measurement, um, the lake has warmed by two to six uh, degrees um, over the last 50 years. And cyanobacteria loves um, lots of nutrients and warm and calm waters. Um, so that's, that's certainly contributing to the likelihood of, uh, of cyanobacteria blooms. And the runoff, presumably, also sure, yes. contributing to the cyanobacteria. Yeah, we, we, the we, we speculate it is, but we under, um, as far as I understand, there's such excessive nutrients in the lake already that um, it's, it's hard for us to kind of disentangle the impact of um, new nutrient runoff from, from any one event. We've tried to look into that in our, our data some. So yes, I mean, the more we add, um, it's not helping. The, the problem, but there's so there's so much nutrient in the water already that um, I think even if we cut off all those nutrient taps today, we'd still be struggling with this for a while. And the warming, the warm water makes that more challenging. Um, calm water uh, it would um, bubblers for like waterfront properties have a meaningful impact, or would it have to basically be everybody along the stretch? Um, like for town beaches, or yeah. Something like that. Unfortunately, way outside my knowledge, um, <laughs> I, I have seen some trials of some different systems like that to, to aerate um, and and some other kind of small scale um, interventions. I mean, I think I think some of those have been demonstrated to have some impact in a small area, but 
Um, it's kind of like some of the tick interventions. You may be able to address it in a small area, but it would take such a huge resource investment to to apply some of those technologies at a large scale. Um, a couple of years ago, at one of the UVM legislative summits, uh, there was a presentation by one of the uh, professors or researchers on uh, use of <clears throat> iron particles to okay. to uh, capture the phosphorus okay. and uh, precipitate it out. Okay. And I'm wondering if uh, there has been any, uh, uh, you're with the Department of Health, I don't know about AMR, maybe this would be an art thing, whether there's been any uh, consideration of using technology like that to yeah. reduce the amount of phosphorus that's already in the lake. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that would be an ANR thing, um, but we collaborate with them on all of the cyanobacteria work that we do, and I can certainly check and, and try to follow up with the committee. Uh, I think this is my last impact slide, um, just uh, related to some air, some air quality issues. The slide I'm showing is about pollen and allergens. Um, where we've seen research from the Midwest that demonstrates um, that ragweed season has gotten longer um, in the northern, the further north you go in the Midwest, the longer ragweed season has gotten, um, partially due, uh, we think, to lengthening of the growing season, um, but also due to more carbon dioxide in the air, which essentially serves as fertilizer for, for a lot of plants. Um, so we don't have any nice data like this for, uh, for Vermont or the East Coast, um, but it's something that we, we track pollen data through one of the um, local allergy clinics, um, uh, and also track a couple of other air quality metrics. Um, ozone is something we were concerned about during hot weather events. Um, during the heat wave we were talking about, there were, were a couple days with high ozone levels too, and that can really exacerbate some of the um, cardiovascular or respiratory conditions. Um, some of the wildfires out west have actually affected us to a, a low level um, with wildfire smoke. Um, we're still not expecting a whole lot of change in wildfire in Vermont, especially if we get w wetter. Um, but we are kind of concerned about wildfire smoke from places upwind of us and what impacts that those could have here. Um, just one slide to, to acknowledge that we're all affected um, by the, these climate impacts on health, but there's certain population groups that we tend to focus more on with our strategies and our outreach, um, people that we think are probably disproportionately affected by these impacts. Um, and I've listed three categories here, and I can give some examples, but people who are exposed to climate effects, um, so with the, the heat um, illness example, outdoor workers um, tend to experience um, higher rates of heat illnesses. Um, but also, as I mentioned, during the heat wave, older adults um, that, uh, that don't have air conditioning, um, for example, in their homes, or anybody that doesn't have air conditioning in their home is going to be more exposed to the impact of that heat event. Um, people with pre-existing health vulnerabilities, um, I mentioned older adults, um, tend to be more susceptible to impacts of heat for for biological reasons um, as our children. Um, but then uh, uh, even other um, other people that don't fit in those age categories, if you have a, a heart condition or a lung condition, diabetes, there's several conditions or medications that you could be taking um, that can make you more vulnerable to impacts from heat. Um, and people with limited adaptation resources. Um, so if you don't have the social network or the transportation, um, local cooling center, um, whatever it may be to help uh, help you stay safe, um, that's going to put you at higher risk. So we kind of focus on where, especially where um, these risk factors overlap and try to direct our, our strategies there. So um, as I was mentioning, older adults um, being highly vulnerable at home without air conditioning, especially those living alone. So that's something that we try to work with partners on. Um, how do we uh, address the heat conditions in the home or um, help uh, provide safety checks or you know, what can we do to, to help reduce risks for that really particularly vulnerable population. Um, and the last thing that I, I wanted to mention and I have one example to, to follow this is um, we like to talk about how, I mean we, we do a lot of work on addressing climate impacts on health, but we also 
want to talk about the potential health benefits of, of taking action to address climate change t today. Um, and we know that related to transportation strategies and housing strategies and other strategies, a lot of those strategies can also provide uh, health benefits and address some of the health concerns in Vermont. Um, I'm going to give a transportation example in just a second, um, but I wanted to also mention that we, um, we try to work a lot with um, the state weatherization program and um, raising awareness about uh, not just the sort of thermal, hot, cold benefits of weatherizing homes, but there's often also improvements to ventilation that come uh, with those weatherization services that improve indoor air quality, reduce moisture and mold. Um, there's a lot of research that shows that um, having a more um, energy efficient home um, it makes it cheaper, but that also leads to um, reduced stress and more, um, more money that can be spent on other things, including um, healthier foods or, or paying your doctor bills or, or whatever it may be. So there's sort of these indirect health benefits related to, to weatherizing homes. Um, and there's a couple of neat pilot projects going on, not just with the health department, but with some other folks as well that are trying to package weatherization and health services um, targeted to people that have chronic asthma or COPD or are at high risk for um, f falling or injury in their home or different things like that. Um, I wanted to mention a, a transportation analysis that we just recently finished. Um, we just we did a, a hypothetical of um, if we met the Comprehensive Energy Plan transportation goals by 2050, what kind of health impacts could we expect? Um, and we came up with some pretty big numbers uh, using something called the Integrated Transport and Health uh, Impacts Model, which is a model developed by some researchers in England and then applied in a couple places in, in the US um, that look at how um, travel behaviors and, and transportation technologies, how, how changing those um, relate to changes in physical activity, safety, and, and air quality. Um, and we found that meeting those uh, comprehensive energy plan goals could save um, 2,000 lives uh, by 2050 and um, save $1.1 billion in terms of reduced healthcare costs and increased productivity um, while also reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, passenger vehicles by 38%. Um, so we thought these were pretty big, exciting numbers. Um, we dove into them in a little more detail to, to look at where those health benefits came from. And um, what was really striking was how much of that health benefit was coming from walking and biking. Um, the gray bars up there are showing some of the air quality benefits from, um, from if, if we just electrified vehicles. And I know that's a big just. Um, that's a big goal to meet. Um, but if, if we just electrified vehicles, there would be some health benefits. Um, and 50 lives saved is, is fantastic. And saving $10 million is great. Um, but compared to some of the other strategies in the Comprehensive Energy Plan, um, the, the, the big challenge for us is getting people more physically active and reducing our, our burden of chronic disease in the state. Um, so meeting some of those other, uh, other goals that get people more physically active um, end up saving far more uh, lives and, and money than um, just electrifying. Um, and again, I don't mean to belittle just electrifying because it's a huge goal and it's um, incredibly important for, for meeting our, our climate goals. Um, but we want to call attention to there's a lot of health opportunity out there beyond vehicle electrification. Jared, I, I don't want to, um, just in our limited time sure. and uh, the presentation materials you brought, I don't know how much we can tease this apart, but I'm really interested in this slide. Okay. Um, but I know there are different opportunities for people who, um, you know, want to walk to work or want to bike to work who might live in a more suburban area sure. of Vermont relative to, you know, um, a couple of the towns that I represent are very rural. Right. Uh, and, um, and frankly, uh, have an older population. Right. It might not be as easy for sure. a 75-year-old to hop on a bike to ride to the grocery store. Absolutely. Um, so just t trying to tease apart a little bit um, where the obvious opportunities are. Okay. Yeah. Um, relative to um, certainly, as you pointed out, we want to get people into more fuel efficient or electrified vehicles, and that's critically important. Right. But some Vermonters are going to have more challenges in 
you know, kind of accomplishing some of these things than other folks, whether it's sure. because of age or because of geography. Yeah. And so I'm just kind of interested in teasing apart, is this kind of low-hanging fruit? Uh, you know, is this our kind of towns and our, you know, more suburban areas? Or right. are we um, anticipating that, um, you know, this type of transition <laughs> in work is easily for, you know, people in Glover as in downtown banking? Right. Um, no, it's a, a great question and um, very real challenges. I, I think one of one of the points that we want to make with this is that there is clearly no one size fits all solution for everybody, and there may be communities that the walking and biking and transit strategies are clearly a better fit for and can be done more effectively at lower cost. Um, and I think focusing on the low hanging fruit first certainly makes sense. Um, whereas the electric vehicle strategies are gonna work well in other communities. Um, we also acknowledge that um, there's about 17,000 households in Vermont that don't have access to a, a, a vehicle. So trying to think about what strategies um, can we work on to help improve um, access for, for those folks. Um, affordability being a big challenge too with, uh, with relying on a vehicle. Um, I think the data I've seen shows that something like 25% of income in Vermont um, uh, on average is spent on, on transportation. So addressing the affordability piece is, is obviously big too. Um, but we, you know, we try to, we try to work with our local health offices on um, a lot of local policies that help um, either get more walking and biking facilities in place um, or focus on land use planning um, to, uh, to get more of the focus development we need to provide more low-hanging fruit for, mm -hmm. for walking and biking. Um, I know some of those are really long-term uh, long challenges, but things that we're focusing on. Um, we also like to, to think about, um, you know, even in the suburban or rural areas, often you're traveling to a place that um, you work in, in Montpelier, you work in Burlington, um, where there's a lot of opportunity to do, you know, maybe not to you might not commute to work on foot or by bus anytime soon, but there's a lot of other opportunity to, to walk or bike um, or use local bus service to get to shops and services. So, um, you know, how to think beyond just commuting and think about the other, I think 80% 80, 80 of the trips we make are not are not commuting. Yeah. Um, so how do we um, how do we take advantage of those yeah. and, and think about more focused um, uh, activity centers where some of these other modes can be viable. Yeah, I mean, just as an example of that, um, my hometown of Thetford has um, really expanded its park and ride in okay. recent years, and a lot of folks in my town tend to commute towards uh, kind of Hanover, White River Junction sure. area. Okay. Uh, and, you know, so in the last five years, um, the town, from an energy standpoint, has made it easier for people to have a safe place to park where there is scheduled bus service that picks people up and takes them you know, to that location every day. So okay. that was pretty straightforward. And interestingly, um, not related to energy, but more health, um, okay. we set up in town a place for people to park their car, not to commute with other people, but a, a, a nice level place near the river for people to park their car and uh, ride their bike to work oh, if nice. they wanted to. And, okay. you know, there's probably, 10 cars in that parking lot every day where okay. people put their bike on the rack, they drive over four hills to get there okay. and then <laughs> work. But it, it, frankly, it wasn't energy related. It was okay. more, you know, health related. Yeah. So, anyway, but, so thank you for this presentation. Sure. I thought it was really helpful. Some excellent uh, demonstrations of the effects that we're seeing already. Uh, what I'm wondering about is, uh, for instance, with ticks. Okay. Walking and biking mm -hmm. is not protecting Vermonters from ticks. Okay. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about what your agency, what your department is doing right now to help Vermonters um, deal with the effects, the health effects of climate change. Okay. To to cope with those, um, sure. and I'd like to know if those are increasing strategies and programs, if they're static, 
okay. kind of how they're evaluated um, sure. and determine whether or not they're adequate or more needed. Okay, that's a great question. Um, it, it really depends by topic. I'll just give a couple of examples. Um, hot weather preparedness is the area that I would say we've been focusing most of our energy on the last couple of years. Um, a lot of that's to do with there not being another clear um, leader on that topic right now in, this, in the state. Um, so that's sort of the gap that we've chosen to fill and some of, I'll, and give you some examples of some of the things that we're working on. Um, one is we, we don't have a dedicated um, emergency response plan for a hot weather event. Um, so we're working on developing that that now in the um, unfortunate increasing likelihood that we do have a you know multi-day um, hundred plus uh, heat event um, that is going to require more resources than we would typically have available to, to throw at something like that. Um, having an emergency plan in place is great, um, but it really depends on a lot of the the strategies um, within that and that we work on in between emergencies. Um, so. As I mentioned, with um, older adults and, and some of their vulnerabilities, we've been having conversations about how do we um, how do we support. Um, well, let me start by saying, community cooling centers are are great a great asset for some people if you can get to a place to stay cool if your home is has gotten intolerably warm. But that doesn't work for everybody. Um, so we we want to have a system where people um, in an emergency or preferably in advance of emer an emergency can have a cooling system in place. Um, we have great structures in place in Vermont already for providing assistance with heating in the winters, but no parallel for, for the summer. Um, so trying to figure out how uh, a program like that could could be operated and funded is something that we've been having conversations about. So not to be argumentative, sure. but really to try and understand the scale of work that's going on in the time yeah. frame. So mm -hmm. what does that mean, trying to figure out? Um, it, it means finding the right partners that could potentially implement a program like that. Actively working Actively, on yes. What's yes. your time frame for um, an emergency it, heat plan? We hope to have a draft ready to go um, by this spring so that we could um, maybe not adopt it, but we could use it to, for action if needed um, this heat season. That's our goal with a lot of these is having at least um, at least a draft or um, some kind of a, a process in place that is probably going to need a lot of tweaking and revision, but that will have some mechanisms. Um, because we know this has been an issue in the heat wave, people call two and one, say, my house is hot, I can't afford to cool it, what can you do? And um, they are amazingly creative and resourceful there and can come up with some ways to respond to a few of those, but there's no systematic way of doing that. Um, so two and one is one of the, our partners that we um, we're working with on this, um, the folks, the uh, other folks in the Agency of Human Services that um, work more directly with older populations, for example. So these are very active conversations that we, we really hope and expect to see some, some uh, results from in the next couple of months. And is 211 currently uh, operating 24 hours a day, 365? I think they've gone back to that. I'm not actually positive. Okay. Thank you. Kind of a related question, yeah. um, and my information here is probably 30 years out of date, uh, and whether it's you or somebody else in the room, but uh, in a former life when at the federal level there was lots of negotiation on LIHEAP funding, yes. it was generally okay. the northern states partnering with the southern states for very different reasons on how to support low-income populations, okay. whether it was in the winter or whether it was helping people through kind of stressful heat times of the okay. year and lower income folks who yeah. need to help with air conditioning. Okay. To what extent do Vermonters who are vulnerable either for health issues or low income issues um, have access to light heat funding for air conditioning, you know, for electricity? Mm. I certainly know yeah. that we have that for, for heating right. and fuel oil. It's none right now. Okay. Um, there are some states that have some programs that support either um, purchasing units or subsidizing some electricity costs to run the units. Yeah. Um, most of those are southern. There are a few northern state examples. New York has a program, um, but our, our program doesn't cover air conditioning at all. Mm -hmm. 
I was just going to say that I, in one of my former lives, I was the weather station director in, in Burlington, okay. and I think it was late 90s that there was a, a, a hot spell in the Northeast. Okay. And uh, I don't know whether it was LIHEAP that paid for it but, or, or weatherization, but there was an emergency air conditioning uh, program that, okay. that, that, yeah. that was implemented in August. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember thinking that it was by the time, you know, it, you know, these things take time, but by the time it, 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 we actually got the air conditioning, air conditioning installed, it was September and it was not hot anymore. But um, okay. so I don't, I don't think they ever did that again. It doesn't seem like a really easy uh, response to hot, hot weather, you know, emergencies. But, right. Okay. Um, Northerners are generally less uh, able to relate to heat um, than we are to cold. Um, if the we have a weather event where it's a week of 90 degree weather, um, is there a comparable cold temperature that we could kind of relate it to, to uh, as far as the health risks to the population expected, uh, <coughs> people expiring, uh, injuries, et cetera? Would it be like a week of 20 below? Yeah. Or? I think it, it's really hard to compare those. Okay. The, the exposures are, are so different. Um, with, for, obviously, there are people that are going to be very affected, um, homeless people that aren't, that are going to be very affected during those cold temperatures. Most of us are going to be OK, because we're going to run from heated place to heated place to heated place, um, whereas that's not an option for a lot of Vermonters um, with the, the hot temperatures. So I think the. The exposure is very different, and the health impacts are, are pretty different. I think the the best thing I can say is that our, our data um, shows that when when temperatures get to the mid to upper 80s, we start seeing this um, this spike in emergency department visits. So I, I mentioned that 87 degree number earlier, which is a little arbitrary, but if you look at days that reach 87 or warmer, we see eight times as many emergency department visits as below 87. Um, so that's what we've kind of keyed in on is, is that point. And again, 87 is a little arbitrary, so that's why I say mid to upper 80s, that we start seeing clear health impacts in our data. Um, we haven't done a similar analysis like that on, on cold days to see if there's a really clear gradient there. Okay. Well, I got it. We're just great. The thing about cold is people keep their houses cool because they can't afford to heat them. So it's a, it's a chronic issue rather than right. an acute issue. That's a good point. Right. There so, are people that run out of, out of uh, fuel. Sure. Well, there's that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There are acute issues. Yeah. Um, something you didn't touch on, and from the few minutes that we have left, I want to make sure you at least get a chance to comment sure. on um, from the, the health risks that you've noted on the earlier slide. Mm -hmm. um, one thing you um, uh, mentioned was mental health yep. issues. All right. Mm -hmm. And um, I suspect there are a lot of things to kind of pull apart there that is affecting kind of the mental health crisis in yeah. the state. Um, you know, climate change uh, potentially being one of them. Right. But to what extent have you been narrow, been able to narrow in on, you know, changes in, you know, weather, weather events um, have had a, have had an impact right. on mental health? Um, honestly, about Vermonters, we know almost nothing about the climate change connections to mental health. Um, there's just, we've never found any good data out there to, to help us quantify or um, give us any kind of decent anecdotal data. Um, we, kn we know from national data that um, there's a couple of connections there that we're concerned about, um, one being just the kind of stress and anxiety about the issue of, of climate change um, is, cl is clearly having mental health issues nationally and, and globally. Um, certainly anybody affected by these different health issues, um, there are mental health, uh, at least secondary impacts associated with, with all of them um, that we have some, some concerns about. Um, so we know that there are a couple of different pathways between climate change and mental health impacts that we have concerns about. Um, we just don't know much about how the, those are actually affecting Vermonters, except for you know a few anecdotes we've had about, um, again, post-traumatic stress uh, impacts after Tropical Storm Irene or some kind of one-offs like that that we've heard about. Um, 
but most of that's anecdotal and we don't really have any great data source for, for learning more about climate impacts on mental health in Vermont right now. Any other questions for Jim? Great. Thank you for joining us. This is actually sure. really informative and, and helpful. You're welcome. And, Happy to. Uh, we, we might come back to you just to dig in on some of these other points. Sure. Uh, particularly, I mean, uh, you know, as you were going through some of this presentation, I was also looking through the longer uh, okay. report that you've given us, and I would recommend that to other folks in the room to okay. look at it. I think there's a lot of really interesting, more granular information there. Great. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Don't go away. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And you can go away. <laughs> you can go away. <laughs> <laughs> go away. <laughs> um, just for committee members, uh, we are going to meet. Uh, actually, I'm going to ask you, Danielle, for help. Um, we're going to go through a few more bills after the floor. Uh, let's say that I don't think the floor is going to be long today. Let's say that we will meet. I will say it. We're going to meet here 15 minutes after the floor adjourns. Um, after we go through those bills, we've got a couple of members joining us. Um, and so to be cognizant of their time from their committees, if we could be here 15 minutes after the floor. After that, we have um, a report from Efficiency Vermont um, that they had done this summer. And again, it's climate related about um, uh, you know, essentially energy insecurity um, and energy burden. Um, and after that, and this is on me, um, I would like to take a few minutes to go over the letter that I have now lost uh, and sent someplace in my computer uh, that uh, hopefully that won't take long, but that we're going to send to the um, Appropriations Committee on the testimony we took yesterday. I think it'll be pretty straightforward, but I don't want to send that without people having a look at that. So that's the rest of our day today. Thank you.